I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro, and welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. This episode, it's all about numbers. Let's actually begin with seven numbers in no particular order, and I'd ask that you not write them down. Just try and remember them. 4, 1, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3. And no, it's not a phone number. 4, 1, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3. The date and time, your birthday, your social security number, your weight, your home address, zip code, your phone number, What's the temperature inside? What's the temperature outside? How many steps have you walked today? How many calories in your meal? What page did you leave off on in the book you're reading? And what channel number is your favorite program on? There are whole numbers, integers, fractions, real numbers, complex numbers, rational and irrational numbers, prime numbers, there are positive numbers and negative numbers. And that last one's something of an interesting concept in and of itself. Negative numbers. Negative numbers have a value less than zero. So if we think of zero as meaning nothing, as in you have zero cookies in the cookie jar, then you have none. How could you have less than none when it comes to numbers? But then again, if the temperature outside is bitterly cold and it could be below freezing, let's say, minus 5 degrees, then you have a negative number. A negative bank balance means that perhaps money's been overdrawn. So it seems that numbers can be less than nothing, so to speak, and therefore negative. There are numbers that hold special significance for people as well, whether it's their birth date or anniversary date or the numbers in their children's birthdays, or maybe it is their house address. They swear by their lucky number, whether they're at a casino or picking a lottery ticket, or sometimes getting a new license plate with a preferred number. Quick, think of a number between one and 10. Was it seven? Researchers have found that when asked to think of a number between one and 10, a majority of us will think of the number Seven. The number seven is usually the overwhelming favorite, but why is that? It seems that the number seven enjoys a long history of positive associations across many different cultures. In fact, if you start looking for reasons why seven is so popular throughout history, across cultures you'll find that the number appears frequently. There are seven days in a week. How many colors in the rainbow? Seven. There are seven continents, seven wonders of the ancient world. How many deadly sins are there? Seven. There's also a powerful connection between the number seven and the religions of the world. Many of us believe that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And scholars have found that the number seven often represents perfection or completeness in the Bible. In Judaism, there are seven heavens. The Quran speaks of seven heavens as well, and Muslims who make the pilgrimage to Mecca walk around the Kaaba seven times. Seven is said to represent the largest number of objects people can recognize without having to count them. Beyond that, say eight, nine, or ten items, and most of us have to consciously count or group them. When we see seven items, we can pretty much readily identify that there are seven of them. For the Chinese, the number eight has long been regarded as a lucky number. It's been said that the pronunciation of the number eight is similar to the pronunciation of the word meaning to prosper. And if you turn the number eight 90 degrees on its side, it resembles the symbol for infinity in math or eternity in philosophy. And you can effectively slice the number eight in half vertically or horizontally, and both halves mirror themselves perfectly, suggesting perfect balance. 
The 2008 Summer Olympics were hosted in the capital city of China, Beijing. And given the affinity for the number of eight, the opening ceremony for the 2008 Games was begun on August 8, 2008, 8.08, at 8 o'clock p.m. So we equate some numbers with good luck and others, well, not so much. Arithmophobia or numerophobia refer to a fear of numbers, sometimes specific ones, and other times just numbers in general, especially complex mathematical computations. Just the thought of solving a difficult arithmetic equ equation in school or doing calculations in day-to-day -day life can cause intense panic in some people. Most common in our country is the fear of the number 13, triskaidekaphobia, or the number 666. So if a majority of people would say that 7 is a lucky number, probably just as many would say that 13 is the number to avoid, that triskaidekaphobia. Although it doesn't fit neatly into a clinical definition of any specific phobia, in extreme instances it can impact the sufferer's life. Fortunately, though, the fear arises only in certain situations and generally doesn't significantly impair someone's life. And regardless of its scientific classification, triskaidekaphobia is ages old. It's often linked to the early Christians. For example, there were 13 people present at the Last Supper, Jesus and the 12 apostles. And some say that the betrayer, Judas, was the 13th person to join the table. But then again, the number 13 is also presented in a positive light in the Bible. The book of Exodus, for example, speaks of the 13 attributes of mercy, the words that God taught Moses for people to use whenever they needed to beg for divine compassion. There's also evidence that that number 13 traces its origins to pre-Christian tradition and Viking mythology. Loki is believed to be something of the wily trickster god of Norse mythology and the 13th god said to have intruded on the banquet of Valhalla where another one of the Norse gods was killed. And finally, the oldest known reference to the fear of the number 13 can be found in an ancient Babylonian code of law dating to approximately 1700 BC. Those laws were apparently numbered, except the number 13 was omitted. Today, many hotels omit the 13th floor. Airlines sometimes have no 13th row in seating. Some cities skip over 13th Street and as we all know, Friday the 13th is considered, well, probably the most unlucky day of all for many people. And then there's 666. Most of us are familiar with this infamous number, often cryptically referred to as the number of the beast in the New Testament, and in recent years as the number of the Antichrist. In its various versions, the book of Revelation says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. This is often cited as one of the most debated verses in the book of Revelation because of widespread disagreement over the identification and meaning of that number. The most common line of interpretation is based on the fact that in ancient times, letters of the alphabet often substituted for numerals. Each letter stood for a number. The problem is that there's no clear link between 666 and any one ancient historical name. Attempts have been made to alter spellings and incorporate titles to try to make a multitude of names fit, but nothing conclusive has emerged. Most commonly, the number 666 from the Bible has been identified with the Roman Emperor Nero on the basis of a Hebrew transliteration of the title Nero Caesar but somehow, someway, none of the hypotheses have ever been conclusive. Needless to say, mention the number 666 and you're bound to elicit a strong reaction. And do bad things really happen in threes? Are you someone who believes that that happens? Whether it's plane crashes or a catastrophic nat natural disaster or the deaths of someone notable. For example, 
Going back a few years, in the same week in 2009, three well-known entertainers died. Michael Jackson, Ed McMahon, and Farrah Fawcett. In 1959, going back even farther, the musicians Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper all died together. And in 1970, in a short period of time, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison died. Within weeks of each other, in fact. Why is it that so many of us think of or speak in terms of bad things happening in threes? Well, it may be that people are just naturally pattern-seeking. The truth is that sometimes bad things do happen in threes, but just as often good things happen in threes. You know, there's that saying, three times a charm. We also have ready, set, go, three words. Stop, look, listen, stop, drop, roll. In the final analysis, if two unfortunate events occur within a short span of time, all you really need to do is wait for some third event to happen, and you've created your triad. Again, maybe it's that sense of things happening in threes. Maybe we know it's pointless and unfounded, but maybe it gives us a sense of control over things for which we really don't have any control. We look for patterns in random order so as to extract order from random disorder. Many people are what's known as compulsive counters. Are you someone who's always counting in your head? Whether it's the number of tiles on the ceiling or the floor, or the number of stairs you've climbed, or the number of strokes when brushing your hair or your teeth, there may be no limit to what it is that you count. In fact, it really isn't the what you count that's important. It's that subconscious need to count. There are some people who need to count up to or backwards from a specific number, that same number every time. Waiting for the light to change, they always count to 100 or backwards from 50. Still other people may not feel right unless they perform a task or a certain number of times. Maybe they have to take exactly 100 steps from their car to the front door every time. It can't be 99, it can't be 101. It needs to be 100 steps every time. And for those who have that need or compulsion to always be counting in their head, they often attach goodness and badness to the tasks at hand. They'll be safe if they achieve the desired goal, or on the other hand, they may fear that something terrible will happen to them or to a loved one if they don't make that numerical goal. And even though they realize it may be irrational, they'll continue to count just to play it safe and not risk something bad happening that that one time they choose not to count. Better to avoid that anxiety. And speaking of anxiety, if the thought of math makes you a little bit nervous, you're actually in the majority. The phrase number anxiety was first coined by researchers in the 1950s and by some estimates, more than 90% of us actually experience some degree of math anxiety. In one survey taken in 2012, about 30% of high school students reported that they felt helpless when doing math problems. And for many people, that fear of math can be traced back to their elementary school days, and specifically to being put on the spot with time quizzes and tests, flashcards, forced memorization. Neuroscientists have, in fact, determined through MRI testing that for many people with math anxiety, there's a fear center that actually lights up in the brain, the same as when they see snakes or spiders. And when that's occurring, the problem-solving center of their brain actually shuts down. It's a bit like that fight-or-flight response. When your body and brain are working on emotion, and fueled by adrenaline, your logical thought processes are effectively disengaged. It's been suggested that one way to address math anxiety is to seek out math problems in the most ordinary moments of your life, whether it's at home using measurements, at the store using prices, or at the restaurant using percentages for tips. The idea is to try to use numbers and math as part of a problem-solving process rather than triggering memories of those dreaded on-the-spot quizzes from third grade. 
So, in the spirit of either alleviating your math anxiety or making you confident in your math skills, I'm going to give you a simple math riddle. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? One more time. A bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat cost $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? The answer? The ball costs five cents. The bat costs a dollar five, and together they cost a dollar ten. And how many of you said, this is a no-brainer, the ball costs ten cents? But if the ball costs ten cents and the bat costs a dollar more, that would be a dollar and ten. And a dollar ten plus ten is a dollar twenty. So the answer is the ball costs five cents. And hey, what about averages? In math, the average value in a set of numbers is the middle value calculated by dividing the total of all the values by the number of values. In life, what do we mean by the average? The average person. John Q. Public, Jane Doe. Well, it means someone who's pretty much like everybody else in the crowd. Someone who gets up and goes to work every day, drives an average car, takes in roughly 2,000 calories a day. Who is the average American? Well, a fascinating study into self-perception found that 55% of Americans think they are more intelligent than the average American. A sort of self-defeating statistic that, in other words, means the average American thinks they're smarter than the average American. Think about that. The poll also found that just 34% thought that they were of equal smarts as everyone else, while a brutally honest 4% said they felt less intelligent than most people. And speaking of averages, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, the average American will produce approximately 28 pounds of trash each year from aluminum cans. 77 pounds of trash of plastic bottles and jars and 77 pounds of cardboard product and sadly the average American will produce more than 200 pounds of food waste every year. It also seems, speaking of numbers and averages, that about one-third of us average Americans don't know our neighbors all that well. 31% of us don't know our neighbor's first and last names. And speaking of averages, published studies suggest that the average adult has a vocabulary range of anywhere from 25,000 to 45,000 words. And we learn about one new word a day until we reach middle age. At one year of age, a child will recognize about 50 words. At age three, they'll recognize about a thousand and by age five they'll recognize about ten thousand words and speaking of averages are you familiar with the concept of the wisdom of the crowd quick story one day in the fall of 1906 a british scientist named francis galton left his home in the town of plymouth and headed for a country fair on that particular day what galton was curious about was livestock it seems he was captivated by a weight judging competition. A fat ox was on display and the crowd of onlookers could buy a ticket to guess the weight of the animal after it had been slaughtered and dressed. Farmers, butchers, and everyday people were among the 800 or so who tried their luck. The best guessers were going to win prizes. And after the contest was over, Galton collected the tickets from the event organizers, tallied up the values of the guesses, took their average, and suspected that they'd be far off the mark when he did so. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The average of the guesses was 1,197 pounds, and the true weight of the slaughtered and dressed ox was in fact 1,198 pounds. An example of how the wisdom of a group of people, the crowd, can often be smarter than the most knowledgeable single individual. 
the average guess of a crowd who estimates the number of jelly beans or gumballs in a jar is almost always accurate. It seems that when people in a group make independent estimates, individual errors and biases are quickly compensated by contrary opinions. So the system is self-correcting and no one person controls the outcome. For crowds to be wise, they need to be diverse and each person's opinion must be independent and free from the influence of others. And clearly, the larger the crowd, the more accurate the average of the guesses will be. The wisdom of the crowd. And numbers and crowds? From 10,000 BC through the early 1800s, the human population on Earth stayed below 1 billion. By the 20th century, population totals soared, more than doubling between 1920 and 1980 alone. That's from fewer than 2 billion people globally to almost 4.5 billion people in just 60 years. The U.S. Census Bureau's International Database found that the world population then increased by more than 50% in the next 32 years between July 11, 1987, and 2019. And according to the United Nations, the world's population is expected to increase by another 2 billion people in the next 30 years to about 9.7 billion of us in the year 2050. And if you're keeping track, by 2050, it's estimated that one in six people in the world will be over the age of 65. That's 16% of the world population. Any chance you remember your Roman numerals? Roman numerals originate, originated in ancient Rome, as the name suggests, and there are seven basic symbols, again seven. I, V, X, L, C, D, and M. And the numerals developed out of a need for a common method of counting, essential to the Romans for communications and trade. Counting was impractical once you reached 10, and so this counting system was devised, based on a person's hand. But I'll bet you didn't know that the Roman numeral one, signifying the numeral one, referred to one finger. And the V for five represented five fingers of the hand, specifically the V shape formed by the thumb and forefinger. And the X for 10 equaled two hands. An X could be found by touching the two Vs at their points. But because there was no symbol for zero, no way to calculate fractions, those limitations hindered the ability to develop a universally understood math system, and so Roman numerals gave way to the more versatile Arabic, or Hindu numerals, where each number counted for itself, and they were read as a single number in sequence, 435. Here's a question. Can't fall asleep? Does counting sheep work? Well, there were a slew of explanations as to the origin of why people began counting sheep to fall asleep. And one of the more popular beliefs has to do with shepherds in medieval Britain. It's said that when shepherds used communal grazing land, they were obligated to keep a head count of their sheep each night. So before they went to sleep, they counted their sheep to ensure they were all accounted for. But the more relevant question now is, does counting sheep to fall asleep really work? And the short answer is, you might want to find some other way to fall asleep. While engaging the brain in a relaxing, repetitive task slows the mind, it's been found that counting sheep is really not one of the more effective means. Researchers have repeatedly put it to the test and discovered that those who pictured such things as running waterfalls and waves at a beach fall asleep more quickly than those who are counting sheep. And actually the most effective means? Breathing techniques. Are you familiar with Rubik's Cube, that classic puzzle invented in 1974 by a Hungarian architecture and design professor? It consists of 27 smaller cubes arranged in a colored 3x3 three three grid. A cube starts out in its solved configuration, and through rotation, it's scrambled, and the goal is to again rotate the faces and return to the original solved pattern, with each side being a uniform single color. For most, solving the puzzle is notoriously tricky. So what are the fewest number of moves needed to solve the puzzle? Well, in 2010, a group of mathematicians found 
that Rubik's Cube puzzle can be solved in as few as 20 moves. 20. But the truly remarkable number is that given all the potential combinations of color changes and colors, not accurate though, there are 43 quintillion possible permutations. Again, most of them incorrect. That's 43 followed by 18 zeros. And think about this, working memory. Working memory is the capacity to hold amounts of information in an active, easily accessible state. Like someone's phone number when they first give it to you, or an address when you write it down. Psychology experiments have shown that our working memory can hold only a limited number of separate items, and that's about seven. Try this with someone. Read the telephone number out loud to them. Wait 10 seconds. Ask them to repeat the number. They should be able to do so without any problem. But then read them a different telephone number and pause. Ask them to count backwards from 50 and then ask them to repeat to you that second phone number. The chances are great that by the time they finish counting backwards from 50, they'll have forgotten all of the numbers of that second phone number. And why is that? Because the distraction of having to perform even simple counting or subtraction in their head prevented them from mentally repeating the telephone number, which is how we keep those kinds of numbers in our working memory and then reinforce them into our long-term memory. So, do you remember that random seven-digit number I said at the beginning of the program? That would be 4172583. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this, and I look forward to you joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. And until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And consider this. It's been said that life is a math equation. In order to gain the most, you have to know how to convert negatives into positives. <laughs>